March the 19th, 2022, was the 90th anniversary of the completion of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. What a great l way to launch Reminisce with Terry. So welcome to the first episode of Reminisce with Terry, where we will look at things from the past that bring a smile to our face, or on occasions, a grimace of horror. I am Terry, based in Sydney, Australia, and I want my subscribers to share with me and others the things that you like to reminisce about. If you like the channel, don't forget to subscribe and press the like button and leave your comments and suggestions down below in the comment section. Before the English landed in 1770, the arrival of Captain James Cook on board the HMS Endeavour. Sydney Cove was the land of the Gadigal people, a clan of the Aura Nation. Sydney's Aboriginal name, Jubiguli, refers to what is today named Benelong Point, which is where the Sydney Opera House stands, whereas Caddy denotes the entire Sydney Cove. The Aura would use their Nawi, their term for canoes, to cross from side to side of the harbour fishing and using established trade routes. When the British first arrived, there were estimated to be over 8,000 Eora people living around Sydney Cove, but within two years of settlement, only an estimated 1,000 remained. As the settlement grew and space became limited, ferry services were started and one of the first and most successful was Billy Blue, a former convict. He established a ferry service in 1813 and became the most successful private ferry operator. Even though his customers paid for the service, it was expected that they would do the rowing. By 1819, more than 5 million passengers, 3.5 million vehicles and almost 45,000 horsemen were crossing the harbour each year in an often chaotic and increasingly dangerous geography of movement that kept the city turning. The Australian writer Christina Stead captured this scene in her novel, Seven Poor Men of Sydney. The ferries flocked into Circular Quay each morning at eight and nine o'clock. The people burst out of the turnstiles in streams which go twisting uptown through the narrow streets. Some walk in the cool and some choose the sun. The office boys in warm school jackets, the clerks in unpressed slop suits, the girls in light blouses and thin floating dresses are already sweating and flushing with the heat. A bridge joining the Sydney CBD from Circular Quay to the North Shore was muted early in the colony's history. However, it took nearly 100 years to see the fruition of this dream. Numerous competitions were run and attracted architects from around the world. Mostly, these did not proceed due to indecision and financial considerations. Even as early as 1840, a floating bridge was put forward. There were many designs submitted in numerous competitions that had been held. And in the early 1900s, the rapidly growing city where houses were crowded, streets congested and waterways bursting with people, town planning had failed to keep up with the demands of the expansion. And with poor sewerage and overcrowding, conditions were ripe for disease. 
the bubonic plague. Between 1900 and 1920, four separate competitions had been held and finally two designers became the leading choices. Norman Self and John Job Crew Bradfield. Bradfield originally designed a cantilevered bridge, but after seeing the Hell's Gate Bridge in New York, he was converted to the arch bridge that became the iconic Sydney Harbour Bridge. Bradfield hired a girl from Lithgow, New South Wales, who was an engineer to be his assistant, Kathleen Butler. She was named the godmother of the Harbour Bridge. Butler oversaw the checking of specifications and negotiations with tenderers, as well as setting up the project's office at the successful contractors, Dorman, Long and Company Limited, London. Bradfield also developed the concept and specifications for the Sydney Underground Rail System that would link with the Harbour Bridge. World War I hindered the progress of the construction of the bridge. And even though a decision had been made to build the bridge, finally, once construction began, it would take eight years. 1,400 labourers, as many as six million hand-driven rivets, connecting roughly 52,800 tonnes of steel beams, and 272,000 litres of paint to construct the bridge. Loans used to finance the construction would take the city 55 years to pay off. In the end, the total cost of the bridge reached over £6.25 million, or more than $500 million in today's currency as well as 16 workers' lives. And unfortunately, the final loss of life was on the very last day of construction before the grand opening. Once completed, it would stand as the largest single arch bridge in the world. Finally, after eight years, the bridge was completed, providing many workers with a job during the difficult years of the Depression. It was opened on the 19th of March, 1932. A young boy, Lenny, who was only nine, made the journey from Victoria to Sydney to see this grand Australian achievement. When Lenny was nine, his father broke his leg while working on the farm. And while his father was on hospital, Lenny took over the responsibilities on the farm. His father offered him a reward 
for doing all of the work and maintaining the operations of the farm. And Lenny asked to attend the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Lenny, age nine, and his pony, Ginger Mick, named after a well-loved cartoon character of the time, in 1932, travelled the 1,000 kilometres from Leongartha, Victoria, to the opening of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Lenny's story captured the imagination of the entire country. And he was invited a prime position in the parade that passed over the bridge that opening day. The opening of the bridge itself was as spectacular as its construction. Before Premier Lang of New South Wales could cut the ribbon and declare the bridge open, Francis de Groot, a member of the ultra-right wing New Guard group, rode a borrowed horse out of the crowd and slashed the ribbon with his cavalry sword. The Premier of New South Wales, Premier Lang, cut a new ribbon. The bridge was declared open and a public bridge walk took place. De Groot was fined five pound. Since that day, the Sydney Harbour Bridge has had a place in the heart of the citizens of Sydney, and in fact has become a world recognised symbol of Australia and the city of Sydney. And in conjunction with the Sydney Opera House, two of the grandest construction feats of the 20th century. And since that time, it has been seen throughout the world on New Year's Eve when fireworks have been fired from the Harbour Bridge and the surrounding harbour a spectacular show that every year impresses people. The dream is real. Doesn't it make you feel you love old Sydney more? Right across the dear old harbour, there's an ever open door. Australia's sons, let us rejoice. It's the bridge we've been waiting for. Folks from Manly Gay. Mountain way. Now they can take a stroll across to Double Bay. If you miss the midnight ferry, there's a path from shore to shore. Australian sons, let us rejoice. It's the bridge we've been waiting for. 